Well, uh, thank you, Chris and Don. Uh, excellent. Uh, didn't expect anything less, of course, especially with your bosses sitting in the audience. We have the chair of the North Pacific Council and the chair of the Pacific Council. Um, next up, we have, uh, we're going to drill a little bit down uh, into the Pacific Coast experience. We're, uh, I'm happy to welcome Dr. Steve Ralston. Uh, Steve recently retired from the uh, Santa Cruz lab at the uh, uh, Southwest Fishery Science Center. Um, this morning I asked if I could introduce him as the uh, Rockfish, Dr. Rockfish Emeritus, and he said, no, there are people that are older than me or something like that. But uh, I, I think the point is, he spent a lot of time thinking about rockfish. Uh, he spent uh, his career, most of his career anyway, on the West Coast, uh, starting with um, uh, looking at the, the West Coast Midwater Trawl Survey, um, look at the, was uh, trying to sample for juvenile rockfish populations. He's done a number of stock assessments, served on the groundfish management team, uh, served on the uh, Council's Scientific and Statistical Committee, and before he retired, uh, was the uh, chair of that committee. So uh, I think we're going to hear a very interesting talk this morning from Steve and uh, talk a little bit about the Pacific Coast experience and uh, how they've gone about implementing annual catch limits. So welcome, Steve. Thanks, Merritt. Um, I have to say, when uh, Andre invited me to speak at this symposium, I, I thought, well, this, this would be nice. This is uh, a chance to return to my alma mater, take a little trip down memory lane. You know, I'm pretty familiar with some of the topics that have happened here over the last few years, having been on the groundfish team in 19... 95 and through the SSC, uh, and then retiring and having a lot of time on my hands. And I thought, this is a great place to come. It's a casual West Coast experience. And then, as a speaker spoke yesterday, everybody had a tie. <laughs> and then Chris Anderson saved me. I was all set to go out last night and buy myself a tie, but uh, I decided not to. Um, so, uh, the title of my talk, you can read, this was actually suggested by Andre. Uh, the short title would be TMI, Too Much Information, because uh, I've, got, I've got quite a bit I can cover here. I'm actually going to go back, if I'm going to speak to how we brought this multi-species uh, fishery back from the brink, you have to know why we got there, close to it. So let's start and talk about the groundfish plan. Um, the groundfish plan actually was management plan was uh, uh, formed in 1982, so it was several years after the initial Magnuson Act was passed. The, I think the council first took care of salmon as a more important issue. In the groundfish plan, there are actually 90 species, and I think we heard yesterday that in the entire United States, there's only something like 540 managed stocks in all the FNPs nationally. So you can say one out of six is in the groundfish plan, and of those, S over 60 are rockfish. So uh, that puts this in a little bit of perspective. There's a lot of uh, stocks to be managed by the Pacific Council. Um, I want to go back to speak to Bill Clark's uh, seminal publication that he published in 1991, because that set the precedent for what the Pacific Council did. At the time the Magnuson Act was passed, there was virtually no coastwide surveys of groundfish on the U.S. West Coast. The first survey that was conducted was 1977. Don Gunderson in the audience, I think, was involved with that. And that was the first coastwide uh, survey that was conducted, and they weren't repeated except every three years. So on the West Coast, we started from a rather data-poor situation at the time the initial Magnuson Act was passed. There was also a, a, a deficit of port sampling information to get age compositions. So from the get-go, the council was faced with rather data-poor uh, uh, information base with which to manage these many stocks. And due to that, it was not possible to really estimate stock-specific optimal harvest rates and biomass levels. So from the get-go, the council adopted proxy rates for many of these things. And the one that they used was uh, Bill Clark's uh, uh, SPR, F35 percent to start with, that was, came out in a publication in 1991. And he measured per capita compensation as a ratio of recruits per spawner at the origin relative to recruits per spawner at virgin biomass. This is your typical uh, stock recruitment relationship, replacement line here, and you can see different spawner recruit curves going from a 2x, 4x, 8x, 16x. This is the most productive recruitment stays relatively high when stocks are reduced to low levels. This is a very low productivity stock where recruitment drops off rather rapidly as the spawning stock is depleted. Bill Clark was able to use this type of 
framework, this uh, uh, spectrum of productivity, and through a maxi-min type calculation, was able to show that there was a, a harvest rate that would achieve 75 percent of maximum sustainable yield. It's in that sweet spot of the yield curve that we heard Rick Mathot yesterday speaking about. However, in doing so, he excluded the two most extreme cases of productivity as biologically less plausible. And the reason for that is because he was comparing what was known from stocks on the East Coast. And uh, ironically, the, uh, many of the rockfish that we're talking about are in this 2x uh, area. So his result showed, if you look at fishing mortality rate on this axis down here, with no fishing here, when you express spawning potential for a fish that's entering the population, a female, coming in, if she has no threat of fishing mortality, she will have 100% of her spawning potential realized. As fishing increases, the spawning potential that that fish has is decreases because there's a threat of mortality due to fishing. By the same token, there is an increase in uh, the yield that you will get from that fish having died due to fishing. His result basically showed that if you reduce the spawning potential per recruit to 35% of the value in the unfished state, this is F35%, that would achieve something like no worse than 75% of maximum sustainable yield. And that's a pretty uh, compelling argument. When you can't measure productivity of stocks, you have something like this, let's go with it. So uh, early, early groundfish harvest rates were based on this type of analysis. High Tower and Lennar is proposed and did analysis for widow rockfish, arguing that a constant harvest rate was a good harvest policy. And I think uh, Dr. Parma yesterday was making similar arguments that following the proper rate is a, is a good approach, as long as that rate's the accurate rate. Um, Amendment 5 to the FMP was passed in 1990. <coughs> Interestingly enough, that established F20% as the overfishing rate. Now, F20%, as you saw from the prior graph, is actually a much higher fishing mortality rate than F35%. So here we had a case where overfishing rates were substantially in excess of the fishing rate that would uh, achieve maximum sustainable yield. And this was established and was monitored particularly for POP, Pacific Ocean Perch, which was a stock that was harvested heavily by foreign fisheries on the U.S. West Coast. And that was one of the activities the groundfish team was involved with when I was on that early in 1995, was making sure that there was rebuilding efforts for POP and that harvests in excess of an F20% rate weren't being uh, realized. In 1990, the groundfish management team and the council formally adopted F35% as a proxy for FMSY. And by 1996, though, some concern had, concerns had developed. And some of those stem from a subsequent analysis by Bill Clark himself, who created a simulation, similar simulation, but had more realistic recruitment conditions in it. Pamela Mace had uh, also conducted some results that suggested that F40%, lower mortality rate, might be a better proxy for FMSY. So uh, I won't go through too much of this. We've been exposed to these concepts from talks yesterday that the 1996 Sustainable Fisheries Act created a new reality. Um, there were targets and thresholds established for both fishing rates and biomass levels, and uh, particularly uh, some very specific requirements for uh, rebuilding overfished stocks. Um, one of the things that happened while I was on the groundfish team again was it became apparent that many of these rockfish stocks were not approaching the type of equilibrium population level that you would expect if they were being fished at a sustainable level. And because of this, and because of the new results from Clark and Mace, the council did decide in 1998 to lower the proxy harvest rate for rockfish to F40% and also recommended that a harvest policy workshop be established. And about that time is when I joined the SSC and we had a uh, very productive workshop. And one of the first things that became apparent was that West Coast groundfish are very low productivity stocks. This is uh, results from a paper by Myers et al. And you can see Pacific Ocean perch, chili pepper, Pacific hake, and sable fish 
West Coast ground fish are all on the very low end of maximum annual reproductive rate, which is the steepness of the spawner recruit curve at the origin. So we have, uh, by luck of the draw, a bunch of poor, bad actors when it comes to productivity. Uh, Martin Doran participated in the workshop, and based on that, he conducted meta-analysis of rockfish productivity, and this is a result from his, his study. Um, it shows that for rockfish, and this is based on about 10 species that were involved, some species have very low productivity. This is basically no production, surplus production at all. And this is a, a fully compensatory stock over here. So some of the rockfish, very low productivity, some very high. And he's used this to develop a prior for stock assessments, and that's been updated through the years and uh, has helped quite a bit in terms of understanding uh, the productivity of rockfish. Based on the requirements to develop minimum stock size thresholds by the Sustainable Fisheries Act, the so-called 4010 rule was adopted uh, by, in Amendment 11 to the Groundfish FMP. Uh, this rule, is, if you know how much fish is in the ocean and you have a harvest rate, that will define a catch. That's the so-called ABC line, which depends on the harvest rate you choose. The Harvest Policy Workshop altered the harvest rates for select ground fish. It was F40% for hake and flatfish, F50% based on Dorn's result for rockfish, and F45% for all other ground fish. The 4010 rule then introduced a precautionary reduction in the ABC to an OY along this green line once you got below the target biomass level. And again, B40% was a proxy for the biomass that would produce maximum sustainable yields. So again, it's both the harvest rate and the biomass levels are, were proxies. Okay. Um, so we've got a problem. As soon as the stock assessment started to be conducted after the 4010 rule was conducted and the minimum stock size threshold was established at B25%, we had a plethora of rockfish stocks that were now overfished and were below the minimum stock size threshold and that needed to be rebuilt to 40%, the rebuilding target. Uh, here's six of them. Their lingcod was another one that Round fish was much more productive. It actually rebuilt rather quickly. So the council uh, was thrown into a problem. They had to rebuild many of these rockfish stocks uh, in short order, or not in short order, actually. All of these stocks uh, qualify uh, to, they could not rebuild in the 10 year time period, so they had, therefore had one. Uh, team in, the amount it would take to rebuild with no fishing plus one generation time. So we had to develop rebuilding plans. We ha and this was accomplished, this rebuilding, uh, through reducing trip limits. Now trip limits is the term people on the West Coast use for what's more uh, accurately described a bimonthly cumulative catch limit. Started out as a trip limit. Uh, you couldn't land more than 20,000 pounds of fish from one trip, but over time people realized that, okay, we, we need to give some flexibility, so it was put into a, a bi-monthly periods, but that's what trip limits refer to. There was actually a, a limited entry buyback po program that the industry sponsored to try and uh, reduce capacity. Uh, you've maybe heard about the Rockfish Conservation Area. You'll see some slides uh, uh, I have in my talk dealing with that. That was a very important <coughs> Uh, action that has been taken and has had, a, I think, a major effect. The industry also sponsored and endorsed uh, uh, gear restrictions to reduce the rollers on trawl foot ropes uh, to eight inches to prevent trawling in uh, high relief bottom habitats. And that effectively removed effort from some of the habitats that uh, some of the more critical species like canary rockfish uh, were uh, inhabiting. And there was also an effort to streamline the management cycle because of the fact that so much was coming down so quickly. So um, the rebuilding analysis was actually a program that uh, Andre developed in for the SSC. It was very useful, forecast into the future under different harvest rates, 
What's going to happen to these things? How fast are they going to grow? The Pacific uh, Council dealt with this problem by looking at the probability that you will rebuild to the target biomass level within Tmax, the maximum time allowable, and choosing a harvest rate and therefore a catch based on the probability that you would rebuild by that time. <coughs> and you can see for many of these different species, there was quite a range. And I will say, philosophically, it's been the Pacific Council's SSC goal to provide the council with the information it needs to make uh, risk uh, decisions. And this comes through both in the rebuilding analyses we've done, but also in terms of the, our effort to quantify uncertainty, which I'll speak to in a moment. So um, some species like uh, yellow-eye rockfish and dark-blotched dark rockfish were uh, the rebuilding plants were predicated on the notion that they wanted to be very sure that these stocks would be rebuilt within Tmax. The most uh, liberal interpretation was 60%. You at least had to be more likely than not that you would rebuild by Tmax. And so you can see there was a range of uh, efforts to rebuild. So once this was established, you had to bring these uh, harvest rates down to a level that would achieve that. This was accomplished through uh, adjustment of trip limits. You can see over time for Boccaccio, uh, once we got into the rebuilding phase, these trip limits became extremely small. And this was created a lot of uh, uh, stocks in the sea that were no longer accessible because of bycatch considerations. Um, one of the primary tools that the council used to try and achieve these lower harvest rates on these uh, stocks of concern was the designation of the rockfish conservation area, which, um, as it was initially framed, was the area between 75 and 150 fathoms. And you, you look at this map, this is central California in the region I come from, and it looks like a relatively narrow band uh, as you look down on it, and it is. But the fact of the matter is, is that roughly 70% of the rockfish catch in the triennial trawl survey historically came from within that band. So even though it was a narrow slice of the sea, that's where most of these overfished rockfish were found. And so um, over time, the rockfish conservation evolved to be more complicated than that. Um, here you can see that this, the RCA became latitudinally stratified so that uh, different areas along the coast might have different uh, uh, boundaries onshore, offshore for the RCA. Not only that, it became temporally stratified. So here, within the 36 to 38 degree north, you can see over time the RCA changed. And the reason for this was to try and uh, provide as much opportunity to fish on healthy stocks as, as could be accomplished whilst protecting the weak stocks. Um, all of this uh, activity to try and do this was based on the bycatch model that was developed by North, uh, staff at Northwest Fishery Science Center. Uh, Jim Hasty, in particular uh, worked with that a lot to identify where could people fish, when could people fish without impacting the overfish stocks. Okay, so as a result of all of this effort, Here's what happened to exploitation rates for widow rockfish. Back in the 1990s, the policy was fishing at an F35% rate, and that was up in the range of 8%, which is really not a very high exploitation rate if you're familiar with fisheries on the, on the East Coast, in the Northeast in particular. That was reduced to F40% because of concerns about the, the, uh, that arose in the mid-90s. And then F50 percent based on the harvest policy workshop that was held in 2000. And then the Sustainable Fisheries Act required rebuilding. And so these harvest rates now for widow rockfish through, I guess this is 2008, were less than half of 1 percent, extremely low harvest rates. And so very effective in, in doing that. Now I mentioned that the council was crushed by some of the workload required for all of this. We've got 90 stocks in the FMP. We've got a number of stock assessments coming through. So science and management practices were revised. And 
First, I want to point out that uh, the stock assessment review process was developed, and this was initially the SSC at the Pacific Council was doing all of the review, and, and it became too onerous for them. This process was devised. I think Larry Jacobson was uh, uh, instrumental in that effort. It provided a much greater per public participation. There's formal representation by members of the Groundfish Advisory Panel in these reviews. It improved the quality of the science of, and rigor of the review. We've got uh, CIE members now are a formal part of the, uh, the uh, review process. It also created what we call a wall of science. Um, Don's familiar with this notion. And the idea is that we go through our science practices and we come up with what we think, the SSC thinks is the best available scientific information and we hand it to the council and that's it. It doesn't come back to the SSC with, well, maybe can you look at what happens if you take out this survey or you add that. And that was, uh, I think, uh, we're, we're all very comfortable with that approach. Uh, Amendment 17 to the FNP, which was uh, produced in 2003, also moved the groundfish cycle to a multi-year cycle. The, ground, the council uh, was having to deal with these updates every year. And uh, we've heard about the NEPA process that was going on. It was too much. And so moved to a multi-year cycle. Now, I, I put this, I developed this graph uh, towards the end of my tenure on the SSC. This is PFMC agenda time in 2009 to 2010. This is after we've gone to multi-year. And you can still see how much of their time was taken up by ground fish issues. It's a, a major, major effort. Okay, some key mandates now of the Reauthorization Act. Uh, People are familiar with these topics. We've gone over them already. Uh, ACLs, accountability measures, SSCs determine scientific uncertainty, and cat shares, et cetera. Same thing, I won't go th through this. New definitions, new terms, new acronyms. Uh, one of the main things for the Pacific Council is that in-season monitoring of landings and discards is considered a sufficient accountability measure, so there's really no need to set an uh, annual catch target. Okay, so uh, towards the end of my tenure on the SSC, we got into this notion, well, it's our job to define scientific uncertainty. How are we gonna do that? Well, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty in the science. I would be the first to admit that. And when you go to set an annual catch limit, that's based on how much fish is in the ocean, what's the right harvest rate to take that fish, what's going on with the forage around it, the ecosystem, the climate, there's uh, many, many variables. Uh, associated with that. Um, so the only thing we are looking at here is how much fish is in the ocean. Clearly an important component of uncertainty is what's the proper harvest rate, how does our species interact with others in the ecosystem, and, and what's the effect of climate. But what we did was we said let's look historically, and this is uh, Pacific Hake, uh, each one of these is a different assessment. 1991, Assessment. The last one that was done in 2009 was the bold line here. So you can look, say, in 1990, and you can see a tremendous range in the amount of fish that scientists thought was in the ocean based on when that assessment was done. And the reason for that is you've got different assessment authors, you've got different modeling software, you've got diff different data streams, you've got different reviewers. Uh, Things change, the environment changes. There's any number of reasons why this, this has happened. But we thought this would be useful to capture this type of variability, to capture the uncertainty in the biomass, how much fish is in the ocean. And we did that. We looked at something like uh, 17 stocks, and actually there were two coastal pelagic species that were also assembled into this. First we analyzed individual stocks, and then we looked at groupings like rockfish, flatfish, roundfish coastal pelagic species, and it turned out that they all were pretty similar. There was really no basis to distinguish them, so we pulled them all together, and we ended up with a distribution of uncertainty uh, fit to log normal deviations, and it fit remarkably well. Um, so we used this level of uncertainty to establish a control rule for buffering the ABC. And so here we see a P-star approach, the probability of overfishing, if this would be the point estimate from the stock assessment, 50% uh, probability of overfishing, 
one way or the other. And so what the council did was adopted a policy of limiting PSTAR to nothing more than 0.45. And once you do that, you, the council could express its risk preference for buffering scientific uncertainty on this axis and say, okay, well, we're very concerned about overfishing this stock, so we're going to buffer it by reducing the ACL, or excuse me, the OFL to the ABC by taking 84% of it. Uh, for a stock over here, uh, this is a, a critical stock, it's, and we need to access it. We're willing to take some risks associated with that, and so in that case, we'd only reduce the uh, OFL to 95%. Uh, because of this now, the harvest uh, control rule was altered. Now the OFL is uh, the old ABC line. The ABC line is now buffered down according to the risk choice that the council expressed. And then the ACL line becomes the old 4010 line. So again, there was no need for uh, an ACT because of the in-season in monitoring of catch and discard. Um, along the way, we had a new casualty, uh, Petrali Sol, uh, it turned out, had been um, more or less fished at a relatively low level uh, for what was potentially available for several decades. Um, note also here that now this is listed as the target at 25 percent, which is the minimum stock size threshold for most overfished ground fish. Uh, flatfish, after this petroli sole situation was uh, detected, a new assessment conducted in 2009, I think, by Melissa Haltuk. The council altered its flatfish harvest policy to have B25% be the target, half of that, B12.5% to be the minimum stock size threshold, also altered its uh, harvest rate instead of being F40% to F30% based on the characteristics of this stock. It's again, it's ironic that this overfished stock was at the very high end of productivity from the Clark analysis, which was the two, two curves that were excluded. So uh, you can see uh, the most three recent stock assessments. In fact, uh, here's Petroli rebuilding under the council's default, <coughs> default flatfish harvest policy. So it is actually rebuilding Quickly, I think Don mentioned that uh, this should be rebuilt within the next year or so, uh, using the default harvest policy, which is uh, now a 25-5 policy and uh, uh, F30% rate. Okay, another aspect, we've got to get ACLs for all of these stocks. Um, one of the things that's happened on the West Coast is there's been some efforts to try and improve on some of the data poor methods. And uh, Restrepo et al. for the stock assessment people in the audience, that was basically an average catch calculation that was used to say this may be a sustainable level of fishing. Um, on the West Coast, uh, Dick and McCall developed what they call the depletion-based stock reduction analysis, uh, or DBSRA, and that was actually applied to something like 40 different West Coast groundfish stocks in the 2011-12 cycle, required a complete <coughs> historical catch reconstruction, which the council had endorsed as an off-year science activity in 2008. Um, and then these OFLs are aggregated into stock complexes. More recently, in the last stock assessment cycle, we had a data moderate level, or tier two assessments that were conducted for, I think, six or eight different species, maybe China being one. Uh, models include a CPUE time series in this instance, so, and priors. Stock status is informed by data, therefore it's considered tier two. And as a result of this, though, it's, there's greater throughput. Normally, a star panel would only have two stock assessments under review, and I think at this panel, Eight were reviewed, I believe, but six made it through. And Andre, you can correct me on that if I'm, I'm wrong. So there's, uh, there is an effort to improve throughput based on the requirement to develop ACLs for all managed stocks. Trial rationalization, I won't go into this in any detail because, again, I think our speakers are going to be addressing this later. But uh, it's very important. And, uh, Prior to the Reauthorization Act, there was a restriction on developing LAP programs for ground fish, and I know many of the fishermen were interested in doing that. 
Now that's happened. Big effort by the council. So let's look at what happened to many of these stocks now. Um, I'm going to show you some slides. These are all similar. Canary rockfish, uh, you're going to see two assessments. An old one, here's uh, Mathot and Piner, uh, 2002, about the time this thing was discovered to be overfished. And then one of the most recent ones, Wallace and Cope in 2013. And you can judge, in the case of canary rockfish, the whole view of the stock hasn't changed too much. And you can see that the stock is rebuilding. It's almost back up to the minimum stock size threshold, in which case it'll be in the precautionary zone. Things are going well. Dark blotched rockfish, same thing. The Rogers et al. assessment had two scenarios they modeled, which weren't all that much different. But again, the stock is rebuilding. And if you recall, dark blotched had a probability of rebuild by Tmax that was rather large. Cowcod. Calcod was a, a big headache for people in Southern California, still is. Um, here's the most recent assessment by Dick and McCall in 2013. It's above the minimum stock size threshold. Uh, there were some rather significant changes in assumptions about productivity of this stock that have resulted in this. So good news for Calcod. Widow Rockfish. Widow Rockfish is rebuilt. Success. Um, it, according to the latest assessment, it actually never was overfished. And, Part of this is based on, again, some assumptions about productivity that were made concerning this stock. Uh, even in the earlier assessments, it was just barely under the minimum stock size threshold. Boccaccio, uh, this was one that was very low. It's actually, again, coming back nicely. It's uh, approaching the target, should be rebuilt within a few, few years. But we've got a couple that are this one, yellow eye, uh, is behaving as we expect, but there's again some uh, assumptions about productivity that have shifted the, the biomass level down. And to me, the most concerning is POP. POP was the species that we knew right from the get-go was overfished, and we've been monitoring it, and it's just, for whatever reason, has not recovered to the degree we would hope. Uh, in spite of the fact that Harvest rates on all of these stocks are way low. POP is this stock right here. It's not recovering. So we've done what we can. So I think it's important that we think about establishing these biomass targets that we're trying to recover to. Are they realistic? Maybe in the case of POP, it's not realistic. Maybe the environment has changed. Uh, maybe, who knows? Is it possible? So um, here I've just simply tried to show what's happened to the fishery. This is West Coast groundfish trawl revenues, uh, 2012 adjusted, tribal and whiting catch removed. Whiting is a big chunk of the, the groundfish fishery. And you can see during the uh, 80s, 90s, there was fishing up of the groundfish stocks. The SFA was passed about here. The groundfish disaster, as it has been labeled, and I think there was a, a time for a, uh, funding to support fishermen. The MSRA passed, and basically the revenues from the fishery have been rather stable. And I think that's about it. Uh, my conclusion from all of this is that the council was given a difficult hand. They were given a, a, a bunch of unproductive stocks. They were given some laws that required some very prescriptive rebuilding. We've done it in large part. Uh, I, I, I commend the Pacific Council, and in some ways I would agree with Don. I would put them at the top of the list because they had to deal with this difficult situation. Um, but that's my bias, too, for having been on the SSC. Uh, and so I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs>